to be talking about religion to relationship. How it all started in the garden when we were walking with God, when Adam and Eve were walking side by side with God. But then after the fall of man, sin, shame, guilt, and other things into the world which created veils between God and humanity and brought us to a place of religion. But Jesus came back to restore that to a relationship with Christ and a communion in the fellowship. And so today, my sister Sophia is going to share first. It's all you, girl. Um, like Arya said, we are going to be sharing with you a message that we titled Religion to Relationship. And since we're talking about relationship, like Arya also said, we're going to begin in the beginning because that's exactly what it was. In Genesis 2:15 through 20, it reads, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree of the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For, you, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God has formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. So this is the first example we see of what God wanted in the very beginning, why he created us. This is a partnership. God didn't need help naming the animals. He didn't need help working the garden. He didn't need help ruling the earth. But he wanted us. He wanted to partner with his creation. Genesis 1.26 reads, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So the word used here is rule, which tends to have a kingly connotation, right? You don't say the manager ruled over public, so you don't do that. Um, so we are made in God's image, you agree? Yes. Um, which means we are made in the image of a king. He is the king. We are not the king, he is, but we are an image and a reflection of the high king here on the earth. And that was his intention, to partner with us to be a reflection of all his glory and goodness here on earth. And that is how it was. Adam named the animals, he gave names to them, and then he... Um, he partnered with Eve to carry out God's work. Um, but then the partnership was broken. Because we thought instead of being a reflection of God, we thought we could be God. Mm -hmm. The serpent told Eve, surely you will not die. Surely what he said isn't true. And he led her to believe that she could be just like God, knowing good and evil. And so... We ate of the fruit, and we cut ourselves from God. And in the rest of the Old Testament, we see God trying to restore this partnership with his chosen people as they fail time and time again. Yes, just like Sophia said, after the fall, sin entered into the world. Adam and Eve became conscious of their sin. They became aware of what their sin was, and they felt ashamed. They sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves and hide their nakedness. And then they hid from God. <laughs> this is how shame entered into the world. Story time. So when I dedicated my life to Christ, I thought it meant that I would become perfect. You know, I was actually, no, I was not right here. I was in there in kids ministry. And I had like the tears going to my face. And I was like, I want you, Lord. And when I left, I was like, this is great. I'm never going to sin again. I'm never going to make any more mistakes. I thought my life was just going to be sunshine, lollipops, and rainbows. And just because I was a follower of Christ that I would never, ever, ever, ever make a mistake again. Well, in short, <laughs> I was incorrect. I was wrong. Not right. I messed up. Did it a couple times. And every time I would beat myself up because of it and ask myself, are you truly a follower of Christ? Are you truly a disciple of Christ? Because you keep on messing up. How many of us can relate to this? 
The definition of shame is a painful feeling of humiliation or distress caused by the consciousness of wrong or foolish behavior. That word consciousness brought me back to the beginning. When Adam and Eve ate the fruit, they became conscious of what was good and what was evil. And after the consciousness of their shin, sin, they went into shame and guilt and tried to hide themselves from God. By living a life of shame, we're creating a veil between us and God. And notice I'm saying we. We are creating a veil between us and God. Now, have you ever made a New Year's resolution? You know, I, I do my little storyboards and stuff, and I, I write my goals on paper, and you're like, I'm going to eat healthy. I'm going on that clean day, you know. <laughs> but then a couple of days, weeks later, you might find yourself in the drive-thru of Wendy's ordering a double cheeseburger with fries and a Sprite. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> and then you think to yourself, well, I messed up. I didn't do what I said I was going to do. Maybe I just shouldn't do it at all. And you quit. We feel that we should just, that is how it is, living a life of shame. We feel that after one mistake, after we mess up, that we should just quit our relationship with Christ altogether. But I've got good news for you. Shame is not the answer to sin. Shame is not the solution to sin or the the solution to messing up. There is no condemnation in Christ. According to Romans 8, 1, according to his word, there is no condemnation. But what there is, is something called conviction. It all starts with conviction. Conviction is a strong belief, knowing what you should be doing and then realizing you're not doing what you were supposed to be doing. It all starts with conviction, but you have a choice. Will you let that conviction lead to a road of shame? Or will you let that conviction lead to a road of repentance? Prayerfully, we choose the road of repentance. Because repentance leads to forgiveness. And forgiveness leads to freedom. When we get stuck on the religious aspect of Christianity, we focus on our works. What we did or did not do. So when we mess up, we can go into a place of shame. I didn't do what I was supposed to do. Rather than conviction, which is I didn't do what I was supposed to do, but I'm going to take it to the Father and repent. But when we don't take that road, that's just what the enemy wants. Satan wants us to mess up and live in a life of shame. To wallow in our self-pity. To live a life with a guilty conscience and feel that we are not good enough to come to God. But that's not the life that God calls us to live. In Hebrews 4, 14 through 16, it says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. So then let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Let us approach the throne room of grace with what? Okay. So not with shame. Not like, I'm sorry, God. But with confidence, Lord, I need you. Lord, I'm sorry for what I did. I need your forgiveness. Because he gives it freely, guys. He gives it freely. His son died on the cross just to forgive our sins and what we did. And if we do not go to him, isn't that taking it for granted? Taking his death for granted and trying to figure out our shame by ourselves. He calls us to take it to him. Repentance leads to forgiveness, and forgiveness leads to freedom. So, church, I encourage you to allow the Father to tear down that veil of shame. Now, on the other hand, have you ever felt so satisfied with your 
own abilities, that you just didn't feel the need to pursue a relationship with God, well, guys, that is called complacency. I believe that sometimes we may forget about God when everything is going well, when our life is sunshine, lollipops, and rainbows, when we are doing the work, and when life is going good. We can get so caught up in our abilities that we forget where they come from. And then on the other time, we can still get so focused on our works that we may think that our works are actually bringing us closer to God. That we think that our works are creating a deeper relationship with God. And we can see that it doesn't. It doesn't. Complacency is being focused on our works, and that's religion. It is. Oh, thank you, Sophia. <laughs> In John 14, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. So are we creating false images in our mind and believing that our relationship with God is getting stronger just because we are doing good works? Guys, that's not religion. That's not relationship. Thank you. That is religion. Thinking that our works are going to get us closer to God. It's like building a ladder of works, 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 getting us higher to God. But that's not correct. Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And no one can come to the Father except through me. He's calling us to relationship, guys. He's calling us to a communion with him. The only way to get through God is to have a relationship with his son, with Jesus. He is calling us to a life of relationship. And this allows God to work, but through us, to fulfill his purpose. In Philippians 2.13, it says, For it is not your strength, but it is God who is effectively at work in you, both to will and to work. That is strengthening, energizing, and creating in you the longing and the ability to fulfill your purpose for his good pleasure. It is not our strength, but it is God who is effectively at work through us. It is God who is effectively at work through us. No works can get us closer to God, but a relationship with him can. So church, I encourage you, allow the Father to tear that veil of complacency, to feel that you need to do so much in order to get to him. He calls us to relationship, not religion. There's not enough that we can do to get closer to God. But there is something that we can do, which is have a relationship and live a life of communion with the Father. Another veil that we may place between us and God is fear. A couple of fear is such a broad term. So I, um, I kind of organized some things that I've seen in my life that um, have exemplified fear. And one was fear to accept the call. Jesus does tell us to count the cost, and there is a cost, believe me. We have to be a sacrifice, a living sacrifice. He calls us to die daily in our flesh. But I encourage you even in that to look at the outcomes. We get eternal life. We get love. We get his grace, and we get his mercies after accepting the call. So let's break that, fear to accept the call. Another one is fear of messing up. But as we just talked about, we have conviction that can either lead to shame or repentance, but we're going to pray that we choose repentance that leads to forgiveness, that leads to freedom. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, and we get to walk in the life of freedom. So let's break that. Another one is fear of the unknown, but God calls us to trust in the Lord with all our hearts and to lean not on our own understandings and in all our ways acknowledge him, and he will direct our paths. He We'll direct our paths. We have to put all of our trust in him. 
We cannot put all of our trust in ourselves, no matter how smart we think we are intellectually and biblically, we have to fully rely on him. Because being a Christian does call us to the unknown. But when we have our trust in God, he is our roadmap and takes us to the places where we need to go. And lastly, we have the fear of being unworthy. And yes, we are unworthy of his love, his mercies and graces. But we aren't worthless. In Romans 5.8 it says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ paid the price because the wages for sin was death. And he, put, he sent down his son to die for us so that we could live a life of freedom while we were still in sin. I think that's worth something. That shows his love for us. So why, yes, we aren't worthy because we're humans and we mess up. But we are not worthless. The Father God in heaven saw us and said, let me send my son to restore this relationship with my creation. When Jesus died on the cross, that veil was split from the top to the bottom. That's divine intervention. <laughs> Look, because I, Sophia, nobody came with a little snip, snip, scissors and was like, can we get a ladder over here? Yes, yes, yes. No, that's not what happened. The veil was torn from top to bottom, which means God wanted to restore that relationship after the, Christ, after the death of Christ. Jesus came to restore that relationship between God and man. Back to its original plans in the garden. In the garden, we, we had to walk side by side with God. It was his dwelling place. The veil was torn, and now we are the temples. We are his dwelling place. We have him in us right now. There should be nothing hindering us from having a relationship with God and going out anymore except the things that we place by ourselves. God is calling us to relationship. He already tore the veil thousands and thousands of years ago. But for some reason, we still find a way to create a barrier between God and man. So it's time to allow the Father to let the veils tear. It's time to stop holding on to the familiar and the things that make us comfortable, but allow God to do a full work in us and through us and among us. Guys, it's time to allow the Father to break the veils. It's time to go to a state of vulnerability because he sees you. If I go to the depths, you are there. If I ascend, you are there. He is there. He already knows what you did. So there's no sense in hiding it. But it's your choice if you're going to repent, if we're going to repent, or if we're going to live a life of shame, which is what the enemy wants. It's time out for that. And it's time to live a humble life and to come to the throne room of God with boldness. To ask for forgiveness, to ask for help so that we can live the life that he has called us to, so that we can be in communion with God, so that we can have a true relationship with God and allow him to work through us and not us working to get to him. It's time, guys, to break the spirit of religion and to go into a place of relationship. But we're afraid. We, we read scriptures like John 3.16 that says, For God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world that he even gave his one and only begotten son so that whoever believes and trusts in him as Savior shall not perish but have eternal life. But we keep going back. John 19.28-30 says, Jesus knew that his mission was now finished. And to fulfill scripture, he said, I am thirsty. A jar of sour wine was sitting there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put it on a hyssop branch, and held it up to his lips. When Jesus had tasted it, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. 
But we don't believe those words. We keep going back to sacrificing doves and calves as if our Savior had not been enough. To veiled eyes, he wasn't enough. He isn't enough. To veiled eyes, when he said, it is finished, it didn't matter. To veiled eyes, all the suffering he endured, every whiplash, every mocking, every drop of blood that he shed, it wasn't enough. It didn't matter. Because veiled eyes cannot see the truth. Veiled eyes cannot see his power and love. When Moses came down from the mountain, he wore a veil to cover God's glory. And many of us still have that veil over our own eyes, to cover our own eyes from God's glory. It's hard because we've grown accustomed to the veil, because it feels comfortable, because we like having it on. We are used to it. But I beg you, as the Spirit has pleaded for me for several days, let him take it off. Take it off and see his glory because it's blinding. It's going to feel uncomfortable because when you're in a dark room for a long time and you come outside and see the sun, it hurts. Sometimes you want to run back inside and sometimes you will... But I beg you, if you just step outside and see the sun and open your eyes and sit there for a bit, then all of a sudden you can see, wow, I didn't know the grass was so green. I didn't know, I didn't know the air was so fresh. I didn't know there was a river of abundant blessings rolling right here in front of me. I didn't see the scars. I didn't see the pain he endured. I didn't see the love on his face when he told me, I am yours. Second Corinthians three sixteen through 18 says, But whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. For the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into, into his glorious image. Does that not sound like Eden? Does that not sound like the place where we could clearly see the glory of God as we walked with him and we reflected his glory? He says, and the Lord, who is the spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. He wants to rebuild Eden in every one of us. In our minds, in our hearts, in our walks, he wants to rebuild it with you. But this marriage, this return to partnership can only happen if you let him take the veil off. If you stop listening to the lies of the enemy and see. God made us for relationship from the very start. But you can't see just how much he wants it, just how much he wants you. Unless you take the veil off. Then we can see, wow, he really does love me, doesn't he? Wow, his love really is wider than any ocean and greater than anything I've done or said, than any fear that I could ever have. And when you see that, when the truth and the glory and his love is revealed to you, nothing else will matter. You can't become something you don't know. And you can't know him unless you take the veil off. So I plead with you and with myself, take it off. And let us rejoice in his love and goodness he's had for us since the very beginning. In many traditions, including Jewish, the bride would usually wear a veil going down the aisle. We know that we as a church, we are the bride of Jesus. And the altar, which is where we come to reinstate a relationship with Christ, is the same place where a bride would go to get married. So he is calling us to that place, to the altar, to come to restart a relationship with him. And as we come, doubt starts to come in. We say, but I did all of this, but, but I still, but I think these things and I say these things and, and I've hurt these people and I've done this. He says, I didn't ask you what you did. You think I don't know? You think I don't know everything that you said, everything that you thought, every single thing that you have done since the day you were born? I formed you. I made you in your mother's womb. I know every thought that goes on your head, whether that be good or bad. I know every word that has come out of your mouth. 
every feeling that you have, every time you've had envy, every time you've felt hatred. I know this. You think I don't know? But I want you. I want you. I know you're a sinner, but I want you. Because you can't do it on your own. I'm not calling you here. I'm not asking you to be perfect before you come, because I know that you're not. I am calling you to be perfected. I know you messed up. I know you're going to do it again, but I love you either way. And do you think that love is not greater than anything else? My father is love. God is love. And God is greater than anything else, meaning that his love is greater than anything else. So take the veil off. Leave everything else behind. Pick up your mat because you're not coming back to this life. For those who belong to Christ are a new creation. The old is gone. The new life has begun. So let him take the veil off. Come to him. And he will make you new. Some may say it's hopeless, they must have never met my God. Some may say it's over, it was finished on the cross. Some may say it's broken, but the healer's in the room. Some may say it's hopeless, but I know that God's about to move. God's about to move. Yes, he is. There's a miracle in the works. And I can feel it. There's there. And there's revival in the church. I believe.
Amen. Amen. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 30 says, come to me. This is Jesus speaking. He says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so today, after everything that we, we, we talked about, from religion to relationship, I want to offer the opportunity for those who may not know Jesus, for those who have, feel, feel like they have to have it all together, that they have to be perfect before they approach God's throne of grace. I wanted you guys to wel welcome the Lord into your heart, right here in your seat. I need everybody's head to be bowed. And in Jesus' name, I pray, Lord, that I pray, Lord, that you touch each and every person, Lord, that is desiring relationship with you, God. They feel like they can't do it anymore, Jesus. They've tried to rely on their own works. They've tried to re rely on their own morality, God. But now they know, Lord, that they need you, Jesus. So right now in this moment, if, if you would like to welcome Jesus into your life and allow him to be your Lord and your Savior, you don't have to raise your hand. You don't have to stand up. You don't even have to come to the altar. It's between you and him. I want you to just say these words with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I accept your sacrifice. I thank you for what you have done for me on the cross, God. And I've tried for too long. But I want to lay it, Lord, at your feet. I want to take up my cross, Lord. I want to follow you. I invite you into my heart. I invite you into my life. Now have your way. And for those who are already followers of Jesus, this is, this is a call to us as well. We can be followers of Jesus and then somehow, some way, fall back into religion. But the Lord, he is calling you to lay all of your works down then pick up your cross, pick up his yoke because it is easy, it is light. You no longer have to carry that burden. You never had to carry it in the first place. He carried it for you. So God, I wanna pray for every person in here today, God, that has been relying on works for far too long, that has been relying on religion, God. They feel like, they need to do these things in order for you to accept them, God. But I rebuke that in the name of Jesus, and I cast it back to the pits of hell, Jesus. I pray, Lord, that they rest in you, Lord, that they commune with you, Lord, that they abide in your presence, God, and help them know, Lord, that you are working through them, God. We have the Holy Spirit working through us, God. And so, Lord, I pray, Lord, that we be reminded of what we have inside of us, God. Greater is he who is in us than, in, than he who is in the world, God. And I pray, Lord, that we be reminded of that today, God. So, Lord, we thank you, Lord. We lay it all down and we allow you, God, to have your way and take control, God. We say this in your holy name.